Hey guys, it's Chris from J Rocket Audio Designs. We're here to uh, kind of show you some of our new toys and introduce you to a few people. Sitting next to me is the legendary Grover Jackson, looking as good as he can possibly look. And that ain't good. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to jump on that. Nope. All right, well, anyway. So Jay and I grew up playing guitars that came from the 80s. That was kind of our era when we had learned the Steve Vai's, the Eddie Van Halen's, all those. Uh, we call it the guitar era of acrobatics. And uh, there's nobody more legendary than Grover for building those styles of guitars. In my opinion, personally, they were some of the best playing, if not the best playing guitars uh, in the history of guitars. Just the way that they did the necks and uh, just made them for the guy that really wanted to play fast. And so when we decided that we wanted to make guitars, we thought, hey, who better to go to than Grover himself? So we really wanted to emulate the old Charvel, the, uh, you know, the older Jacksons, but there's some stories behind that. And I would love for you to kind of tell the real story behind Charvel and when you bought in, how you took over, the whole scenario, because a lot of people aren't aware of that. I was actually surprised to hear when you told me about it. Yeah, I, I have not, you know, over the years made it my business to um, uh, try to build some historical record. Um, I didn't just didn't feel like it was necessary for me to do that. And in the absence of some sort of definitive statement about the person that was at the center of that, which I guess was me, and when I say center, I mean center of our company, Jackson and Charvel, People make things up in the absence of an authoritative record, and uh, I have it that some of the stuff rankles me some, but it's okay. I don't care. You know, yeah. we all die <laughs> eventually. <laughs> eventually. So, yes. um, in uh, 1977, I'll try to give you the cliff notes as, as best as I can. 1977, I found myself out of a job and. Uh, was going to go back to playing guitar because I had played guitar in bands when I was younger and um, <clears throat> I went out to a little guitar repair shop called Charvel Guitar Repair in Azusa, California to buy a body and a neck um, <clears throat> that weren't being made there, they were being made someplace else and uh, encountered a guy named Wayne Charvel and we became friendly and in the course of the conversation um, he had some legal difficulties. I won't go into the, the abstraction of that, but uh, um, e eventually I offered to come in and help him with the business. And I said, if I can save your business, because he was prepared to, uh, to go bankrupt, then I said, I, I want 10% of the business if I can help you save it. So I worked that way with him from, from late 77 until um, the fall of 78 when the pressures of his legal problems had become so difficult that he said, I, I've just got to go bankrupt. And I said, well, that's great, but you know, I've got now a year invested. I mean, I was working there for no salary. Just the only carrot at the end of the stick was if I could save it, then I got part of the business and I didn't have to work for somebody again. And uh, <clears throat> so I, the upshot is that he said, well, look, I, I want to walk away with no obligations. Uh, and the company was about, it sounds like not much money today, but in those days it was a lot of money, $33,000 in debt, mainly to a little machine shop in Upland, California called uh, F&M Tool and Die. And that was um, for some punch uh, parts that, that they did, uh, single layer uh, white strap pit guards and four hole aluminum jack plates because that's in the days when Les Paul still had plastic jack plates and the first thing he did was broke the jack. Just right? replaced one of those myself. So um, I borrowed s some money from my dad who said, you know, if you piss this away, don't come home. And uh, I took that as a sort of a threat and uh, I don't think he meant it, but whatever. And um, as a down payment, I, I, I bought Charvel Guitar Repair and Charville Guitar Repair was, was doing guitar repairs and was selling the single air strat pit guards, the aluminum jack plates, and stainless steel tremolo arms for a traditional style strat. And that was retail. And I actually still have the guitar player magazines with those ads in them. Um, 
And so on November 10, 1978, I bought 100% of that company. Um, we started doing job shop work, first for Mighty Might, making some bodies for Mighty Might, and then we made bodies for DiMarzio. Um, <clears throat> and along the way, just you know, thought, well, for making wooden parts, we might as well make some guitar necks and put some guitars together and see if we can sell them. And that's when the first Charvel guitars, production guitars, were made. Or sometimes they're listed online today as pre-production guitars. So the era that you came in was pre-1980, which is kind of where Charvel, you know, became famous for the, the San Dimas Charvel. Right. And that was you. That was me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that, that I never knew. And you... You know, well, I'm, again, I, ha I haven't I haven't made it my business to correct people when they yeah. when they fabricate history, sure. uh, and there's been a lot of fabricated history, well, and I won't you know I won't take a shit on anybody for for saying that, but I mean, um, I was there. Yeah, I've got the paperwork. <laughs> the paperwork has the dates on it, yeah. so uh, I'm pretty secure that I'm not hallucinating. Um, and I started with. Uh, with two employees, Carl Sandoval, who's known for the Randy Rhodes polka dot V, sure. and a guy named uh, Mark McKee. And that, so the, Wayne left, and there was the three of us. That was in November of 78. By January of 79, both Carl and Mark quit, because they figured if the jerk that was here before couldn't make a run out of it, this jerk can't make a run out of it. <laughs> and so now it's January, I owe my dad a bunch of money, and I'm in a building by myself. Um, the first two guys that I hired were, were Mike Eldred, who went on late, later in life and who's still a friend of mine today. Uh, he ended up a decade or more later running the Fender Custom Shop and was a pretty major figure at Fender for a number of years. And a guy named Don Fox. And then from there, it, it, the core group, which includes Mike Shannon, who is now Mike Shannon of the the Jackson Guitar Company, um, and the core group started to, to coalesce, and by 1985, there were about 130 of us. So the, 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 uh, the rate of expansion of the business was pretty dramatic, and uh, you know, it, it, would, it would be very easy for me to say that I'm responsible for that because I was the, you know, the kingpin. The, the truth is, um, being successful in business is sort of like a, a three-legged stool. I'll try to get this homily correct. Um, the first is hard work. If you want to be successful at whatever it is, a golf pro or an auto mechanic or a guitar maker, you got to work hard. Okay, you got to put you, your... All uh, you young kids out there. Yes. You got to keep your nose to the grindstone. And then the second thing is you got to be not completely stupid, okay? You have to at least somehow figure out how to make a few good decisions. Sure. You're going to step in a cow patty every once in a while, but if most of your decisions are reasonably intelligent, then that's a good thing. The third leg of that stool, and I think the most important leg of the stool, is the one you can't control, and that's luck. And, and I, my, my little homily about that that I've used for years is the Beatles. The Beatles from Buenos Aires. I don't think so. Uh, the Beatles from Tokyo. No, I don't think so. The Beatles were the Beatles because they were really good at what they did and uh, worked really hard, had great management, you know, Brian Epstein, and they were lucky. They were in the right place at the right time with a product uh, that the world was hungry for. Sure. So if they had not had the other two legs of the stool, they would have been Jerry and the Pacemakers, who nobody remembers today, okay? Regardless of how great they were, they weren't the Beatles. So luck plays the greatest, is probably the most important of the three legs of the stool. And I was lucky. Lucky I was timing. Yes. Um, 1980, 81, 82. Los Angeles became the center of the known universe. Yeah. That was that was, um, and one of the things that I sort of lament is is that I don't believe that there's ever been a good movie made 
that sort of records the passion and enthusiasm and excitement of that era in Hollywood. Um, and I, I think that's regrettable that, that nobody's been able to capture that. I don't, I don't think that the decline of Western civilization, that movie by Penelope Spears, really does that. Um, uh, but it was an exciting, exciting moment, and the young people were coming from all over the, the world to, to celebrate this music, and, and uh, it was an exciting time. And I was able to be sort of in the center of a lot of that, and that was, it was, it was a, a great window. Uh, I'm rambling too far. What, no, no. Uh, I mean. You're a hundred percent correct, and I, you know, I kind of came in at the tail end of that whole, um, well, I call it the hair metal era. What year? '86. Uh, okay. So it was kind of the beginning of the end, right? It, 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 I think it probably peaked '86, maybe '87, certainly by '88, and then in '89, MTV said, "Metal? Mm -hmm. I don't think so." Here's Nirvana. And and <laughs> you know, and I think we talked about this the other day. Um, the first time I heard Feels Like Teen Spirit, I, I went, oh shit, we're in trouble. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a massive record. Um, it took the genre to a different place. Um, the, the metal community had kind of expanded itself to a place that wasn't that great. It had kind of run its course. Yeah, I kind of theorized. I don't think we could have predicted that. Yeah, you I know, I mean, I mean, nobody, as we were in the stream of this 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 set of events, uh, it sort of felt like it was just going to go on forever. Now, in retrospect, you know, with a little bit of perspective, you go, well, that couldn't go on forever. Yeah, uh, but at the time, it sure felt like it. I, I've, I've kind of always theorized that musicianship got to the point where everybody was a virtuoso, and if you didn't come out and just knock the socks off of people because of your talent as a musician, um, you, you weren't really taken seriously. And I think they got to the peak where you just couldn't get any better and they couldn't continue to find virtuosos like that. Uh, you know, it's just my theory that they dumbed music down a little bit so that you could find the four chord bangers out of their garage and create an entire new industry out of that. Right. But I kind of see it coming back. Like when Nuno Betancourt released, you know, that new solo, uh, they're calling it the solo of the decade or the yeah. century. And, no, he's a, he's a monster. And I always say, yeah, but what about, that was, that's Nuno. He's been doing that for 35 years. Yeah. We, you know, I, I think we've all been a part of that. You know, I, I, I agree with you somewhat. Um, it's songs. Yeah, it's 100%. it's songs. You know, the guy in the pickup truck driving down the street wants to be able to. Well, if it's a guitar solo, he wants to be able to hum the guitar solo. If it's a chorus, he wants to be able to hum the the chorus. There has to be a hook. There has to be good songwriting. Yeah. And by the end of the '80s, things had been um, sort of um, sieved out so much that the songwriting really started to, to lack. Um, uh, it's all about songs. It, it, the, the music industry has always been about songs, um, whether it's I'm Dreaming for a White Christmas or what, what I mean, it, it, it's songs, man. Yeah, and, sure. and songs at the end of the 80s became secondary to how big you could get your hair or how tight your pants could be. <laughs> and um, the, the wind shifted. And when it shifted, it shifted hard. It did. So. Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, back then, that was the era of the guitar hero. That's what drove a lot of musicians to become musicians, especially guitar players. But, I mean, you saw it in the drummers, the bass players, the singers could sing higher than I could ever imagine. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I came up with that. my philosophy of this virtuosity just existed everywhere. And you couldn't keep growing or that ceiling couldn't get any higher. And eventually they had to kind of dumb it down. Yeah. Not that Nirvana's dumbed down. It's a different era of music and yeah. it was in its own right. Well, and music. it was a great song. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it, was a, it was a song that, that, that slapped you out of the chair. But that's the beginning of the end of Guitar Heroes. Y right? Yes. No more guitar. The anti-guitar hero became the thing instead of the guitar exactly. hero. And I, we're starting to see that kind of come full circle, and and that's why I reference Nuno because he he did a solo that was very reminiscent of what we all heard from Extreme growing up. Yep. And I think the younger kids today they're not used to that, and they see it as a new thing. 
Right. And I've even seen like the Rick Beato interview with Nuno. Even Nuno said that. He's like, look, I've been doing this for 30 years. You just finally heard it for the first time. Right. I'm a huge Nuno fan. I mean, that, that was a huge influence on myself, on Jay, on everybody I know from that era. But um, yeah, and th hence the reason why we came to you to build guitars such as these. Yeah. We wanted to go for something that gave you that classic Fender Stratocaster look that somebody modified into a Super Strat. Right. And who better than you to go uh, consult with when, when it comes to the neck playability. Uh, we wanted that playability of an old Charvel, old Jackson, but we wanted the look and the vibe of a Fender. So, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't think anybody today wants a Pepto-Bismol pink pointy headstock. Probably not. But they still play great. I mean, I, I can put any of my old Charvels into the hands of a modern day guitar player or a blues player, and they can't argue that it plays great. Right. It's just, you know, you know, the looks change, the fashion Yeah, I, th changes. I think that probably the era of the pointy head has come has, has seen its day yeah. uh, to, to a great extent. And who knows, it may um, come back. Um, in, in my case, um, in, the, in the beginning days, to kind of go back a, a little bit, um, I had been a guitar player and had owned um, Sunburst Les Pauls and I'd owned a couple of real V's and I'd owned a couple of Explorers, I'd owned Strats and Tellys. I already had a pretty good idea as a guitar player what a great guitar was. Right. And in that era of when we were starting the Jackson Charvel uh, company, um, Fender and Gibson both were at a real low spot, and I don't think that's a, any revelation. I think that's pretty commonly known that the quality sure. of those instruments right then were not great. And so as we started in this repair business, what we would see is, uh, you know, a guy buy a Stratocaster and he'd bring it in and say, yeah, well, can you give me big frets and flatten the fingerboards so I can bend the strings? And can you put tuners on that actually tune and, yeah. and maybe put in some high-powered pickups? And the... The epiphany was, well, why the hell don't we just make that? And that was really, it, it wasn't, I, I've made a strong distinction between whatever I've done in my life and somebody like, let's say, Ned Steinberger. Mm -hmm. Ned Steinberger looked at the, at the guitar and, and, and reimagined it as something different. And I honor that and I respect him for that. I saw something and said, how can we evolutionarily take it to a different place in incremental steps? So uh, that, that's what I think that we really brought. And, and these instruments represent that same continuation of how do you take something that's already familiar, already accepted, and just make it incrementally better so that it more suits the style and the playability that a guitar expects out of a modern guitar. Sure, and your audience kind of came to you and told you exactly what they wanted. Yeah. Um, and I think this can help us uh, really take a different uh, viewpoint of Eddie Van Halen when, you know, he, he's credited for creating the Super Strat just out of necessity, right? right. Or, or his preferences. But I don't think a lot of people know the real story. You know, you hear you know, how he got his first guitar and how he made his first guitar. But I mean, when you really boil it down to the fact that uh, you were involved in that initial guitar, uh, you kind of helped in the beginning of all that. I, I, I came in, it, no, uh, the, the initial, the, the white and black guitar on the first record, mm -hmm. I had nothing to do with. I, I want to be very clear about that. Okay. I, I don't want to misrepresent anything. Uh, the black and yellow guitar on the cover of the second record, uh, I built. And in fact, um, Ed called at about midnight and woke my wife Joanne and I up to inform us that he needed the black and yellow guitar the following day at Paramount Studios to, for the photography session for that second album cover. So uh, she, Joanne delivered that guitar to Paramount Studios the next day. Okay. Um, so that was a guitar that I made. Uh, I, I thought and fashioned would... on the black and white one. The black and white one was really before my, sort of evolved before I, w I came on the scene. And that was a boogie body. It was a boogie body, was yes. Was it a boogie body's neck and body? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I thought I had remembered you telling me that you had just given him a scrap guitar out of the back of the warehouse. No, uh-uh. No, that, okay. that, no, that the, the white and black guitar was had nothing to do with me. There were other people Warren me to be Martini a little later on. There were people right. that would come that didn't have money for full blown guitars, and sure. I, I would either sell them scrap pieces or give them pieces. Okay. 
uh, over time. Uh, but no, the white and black guitar had nothing to do with. That's okay. just the honest truth of, of that. Well, and I think it's a hot topic, right? A lot of people always ask questions about that, and uh, you know that ultimately became the Frankenstein guitar. Yeah, you know, the famous it, one. Just it, it was an in, inveterate uh, uh, sort of tinkerer. He yeah. liked to tinker. He, um, I, I don't want to get into too much about. I had a very complicated relationship with Ed, yeah. and uh, um, I, I think. Th what I would like to say is that Ed changed the landscape of guitar playing. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm an older guy. I was older than that gen generation, not by that much, just seven, eight years. But seven or eight years when you're 21 years old, is old you're an old sure. man, right? Mm -hmm. My era was the big four in the 60s, Clapton, Page, Beck, and Hendrix. And they set the, the mold, created the mold sure. for what a generation of guitar players thought a guitar was supposed to be. And then Ed came along and 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 rearranged the furniture <laughs> to suit. Uh, I mean, it, I, I don't believe that there's ever been a single guitar player that has had so, as much impact on modern guitars as, as Ed. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but he was a complicated guy. And uh, as my friend Steve Rosen's book, uh, uh, talks about he, he was a complicated guy, but but uh, uh, he changed everything and influenced more. Pe if you love the guitar, yeah. and I do, and I've spent my entire life with the guitar, you have to give props to the guy who made, who brought the most amount of people to guitar playing, and uh, that would be Ed, without a doubt. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. I mean, people want to have the Hendrix, Van Halen. All of those guys, Jeff Beck, they're all amazing, but I don't think anybody really turned the tides like Eddie did. It, it, it changed the whole nature of guitar. Yeah. So well, that brings us to where we sit today. Um, Jay and I are very influenced by that style of play. Uh, not many people are going to be willing to buy, as we talked about, the pointy headstock guitar. So we wanted to come up with something, you know, in conjunction with your ideas, of something that was very playable. That could do pretty much anything. It's like it, I guess we look at it as the ultimate working man's guitar. Um, got some of the push push pots that split split the humbuckers and and put pickups in different places for sounds that aren't really available on guitars that you can buy off the shelf. Um, we wanted very specific things like the neck width, the fret size, right. um, just to address the things that we didn't like, like pulling your high E off the end of the frets. Right. Just wanted a little bit more real estate there. We wanted to slam the Floyd Rose to the body, kind of like Eddie did right. at the very beginning, because it creates better resonance. Plus, when you're playing live, if you break a string, you don't have to worry about the whole thing getting out of whack. You get through the tune. That's yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you can float them if you want by tilting them forward yep. and, and do the Jeff Beck thing. And amazingly, they stay extremely resonant. But I have to admit that these are some of the most, if not the most resonant guitars I've ever played. In fact, the video I showed you recently of just uh, one of our friends playing it acoustically. Right. A lot of people are like, how can that be possible? But it's true. And everyone, even though they each have their own character, they all have that same dynamic, which is truly amazing. So, you know, we're, we're only building, building a limited run, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm hoping that they catch fire, and we can do a whole a lot of projects with you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Grover is originally from Chattanooga, and we all kind of currently live uh, around the Nashville area. Jay is out in Knoxville, and uh, Grover is in a small town called Pulaski, about an hour south of Nashville, Brentwood area. And uh, he's got a big shop here, and we'll show the shop on um, uh, the video down the road and uh, kind of show you the process of how the guitars are built. But uh, it's nice to see somebody like Grover who's still in the business, and he's still making products. and. He's making products that have evolved. So the fact that the, the old Charvel, old Jackson DNA is still there and still available, um, for us, being nostalgic, it's a great thing. So I'm glad for our personal reasons that you moved here, but I think a lot of people are going to appreciate what we've done, what we've done here, and, uh, and hopefully we can keep the whole Jackson thing alive in one well, way or you. another. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's really great. And, and yeah. I... Um, I'm glad that you were very amenable to the really worn out look of things. I, I've yeah. been a big fan of beat to crap guitars I, forever. And I uh, these, these really exemplify that. 
Okay. Well, and the way we see this is that we kind of refer to these, even though they're not going to be cheap, they are the working man's guitar. Yeah. If you get out there with a, a brand new Les Paul, you don't want to hit the headstock or nick the body. And, and maybe subconsciously, it's something you worry about when you perform. Something like this, if you fall on it, if you scrape it, if you bang it on a mic stand, who cares? It just adds to the uh, character the character and the relic. Yeah. But, uh, some people, you know, think it's, well, if you didn't do it yourself, but, you know, it really does aid in um, focusing on playing versus focusing on, you know, making sure your guitar doesn't get dinged or... Yeah, I mean, it's 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 great to have a, a, a wonderful 10-top Paul Reed Smith guitar, and sure. they're very beautiful, but you really want to take that to a VFW club. Yeah. I I, I'm just, you know, I'm wonderful to have that instrument, but do you want to take that into an environment where somebody may throw a beer on it? I, I don't think so. So um, it's interesting you use that terminology, the working man's guitar. That, that actually is a terminology that I used all the way back in the 80s with Jackson Charvel. Okay. The, the admonishment or direction to all of the people, great people that I worked with uh, in the 80s was that we're making tools. Yeah. Let's forget about the fact that there's famous people. Let's forget about the fact that uh, that this is the music industry. We're making tools for a workman, and the the tool that we're trying to make has to has to work well for the job that the person who owns this object is going to use it for. Yep. So try to take the glamour side away from it and bring it to the to the the conclusion that it is a working man's object. Yep. So it's, it's yeah. great terminology. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. yeah, maybe, you know, Mick, you had asked earlier, what are we gonna call the guitars? Maybe that's it, right? The working man. <laughs> it's not a bad title. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, for us, we're excited about all these. I haven't played them all, but um, I'd say every one that I've played, I would own, which is a great thing. And, and I like doing things in small batches so that the focus can be on each individual guitar. Right. Um, you know, just like anything with our pedals, when you mass produce things, you're just going to deal with mass problems, you know, and they might be little, but it could infect, you know, 50 enclosures or a thousand enclosures and you've got to redo them. And right. when you're able to take the time to pay attention to the details of every little build, um, I think that's always a better approach. Yep. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, hey, we appreciate everything that you've done with us, for us. Well, thank and you. we're certainly, hopefully, going to do more. Um, but I think these guitars, it, it, you know, personally, if it weren't uh, a rocket guitar, it would be a guitar I would own. And, and, you know, obviously it sounds like I'm trying to sell a guitar here, but I'm thoroughly impressed with what we've created together here. So we, we appreciate uh, everything you've done. Well, thank you, too. It's, yeah. been a, it's, a, it's a great project. We've had great fun with it. Yeah, it, it's great.